London is not just some city. Its spirit stands outside of time. Certain places have influenced its citizens. It is not only a setting, but a presence, a character in various films, novels and poems. My name is Philip Röttgers and I search for London's spirit. I think there are two particular ways to explore the powerful and mysterious place that is London, through literature and through walking. Follow me into a secret world. Follow me to London beyond time and place. In this series I will explore its spirit by walking the city and talking to London enthusiasts. I invite you to join me. Together we will discover London beyond time and place. This is Talks Beyond Time and Place. Yeah. Hello everybody to Talks Beyond Time and Place. Uh, my name is Philip Rodgas and my guest today is uh, Camila Oliveira, I think. I think I pronounced it correctly. Just correct me if I was wrong. And uh, Camilla is my guest today because uh, we both share an interest in William Blake and uh, we both are proc folk heads in musical terms and uh, we like the same kind of music and this combination is basically the reason why uh, Camilla is my guest today. And uh, Camilla is a Blake researcher from Brazil and uh, she's specialized in Blake and music and uh, in her PhD thesis, she discusses Blake's reception in the 20th and 21st century in popular music. Um, and because of this, she has been conducting interviews with musicians inspired by Blake's works, uh, by Blake's work, sorry, for example, Bruce Dickinson of Iron Maiden, uh, Tim Blake, Gordon Giltrap and Ed Sanders. And uh, she's also a translator. Uh, she translated the lyrics of Dreth Hotel's Thick as a Brick 2 part two into Portuguese and now she's working on the translation of Jerusalem, Blake's magnum opus uh, to Portuguese. So welcome Camilla. I mentioned that you're writing your PhD on William Blake and on popular music and I think this is an intriguing topic. So maybe you can tell me a bit why and how you, you got interested in Blake, how and when this all started. Uh, first thing, I was skipping classes in the library. It was something very common because I studied in a technical school and I was not technical at all. I didn't like the whole, uh, you know, hard science and it was quite uh, challenging for me. And I, I've always been a literature and arts person. So it was very natural, um, very common to find me in libraries and in the school library because I was always there and not where I was supposed to be. And uh, that's how I found <laughs> and that's how I found Blake. I was, you know, looking for uh, some literature to read. And I found a, a book in a in a black cover. I I think I have this copy here. You can show uh, it. It's a, it, yes, it's a Brazilian trans uh, edition. Um, it's a bilingual edition and you can find, you know, the original and the, the, the translation. At the time I spoke no English, okay. so it was um, quite challenging for me to, you know, to understand the original. And, but I, I, I could perceive then some, some music, some sound, even if I wasn't able to pronunciate it, to understand it, but the translation helped. And I was, um, I was completely in love with what I found there. And that's how it's, it all started. And, and that's when I decided to learn English by myself. So I bought myself a dictionary and I was wow. trying to translate it, the poems myself. Of course it was, you know, the translation was awful, but <laughs> that, <laughs> that's how it started and I, I, I left my hometown to go to Sao Paulo to study with uh, some Blake specialists there. And, you know, that's, that's the story. That's the beginning of the story. And since my undergraduate and, and postgraduate, I focused uh, on, on Blake. 
in the beginning, it had a more um, mystical approach, so to speak. So I wanted to to read him through that sort of mystic mystical key. Mm -hmm. But afterwards, I ended up focusing on music, especially because it's also one of my greatest passions. I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a prog head. I'm a folk rock head. So. Uh, I decided to combine two of my passions, and that's how I ended up uh, writing, um, you know, my masters and my PhD on on Blake on and music. I think this is a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful combination, and um, yeah, I like the I, I like the idea uh, very much. So, so how and and when exactly did you? Did you say this is going to be my PhD? Was there some some key moment where you said I'm going to write and a PhD about this combination, Blake and music? Well, to tell you the truth, I... Maybe there was something, but I, I, I can't really remember something specifically. But what I can tell you is that I could see not... Uh, I was able to, to perceive somehow that in rock music, some of the things that Blake said in his poetry, in his literature, resonated uh, uh, with uh, the music I listened to. So uh, it was a very um, powerful combination and I, I could see that uh, it wasn't an accident that I, yes. I liked that, so, that kind of music and I liked Blake. And that's when I started my investigation to see, you know, if they if, if musicians have set Blake to music and I found plenty of them and I was really amazed. I was shocked by, by the number of, of, of compositions, of settings, uh, some direct, uh, um, d directly inspired by Blake, some more indirectly, but he's always there. I think his values, I think his, um, his theories, yes. if we can call them theories, they, they, you know, they're all there. Yes, yes, I agree. I was also astonished when I did a bit of, of research for our talk. I looked at, so, so who exactly incorporated his, his ideas and, and in, into music or who was influenced by Blake. And I was really surprised. I mean, I, I know a lot of artists and, and musicians who are influenced by him, but I was surprised at the, at the the number of musicians that I didn't know about and that I do listen to. And it's the same with me. I thought, yeah, it's, it's these ideas. This is why I like this kind of music. And this is why I like Blake and, and his, his poetry, his ideas, his engravings, it, it fits together. And it's nice. It's, it's, it's a good comment. Yes. For example, for example, I, I, I read somewhere that you published a book on Genesis. Am I oh, yes. correct? That's, that's yes. true. But yes, just to, you know, to give you uh, an example of, of this sort of, um, a presence of Blake in music. In, in Supper's Ready, there, there is some reference to, to Jerusalem and did yes. speak in ancient times. So, you know, everywhere you look, you can find something. For, uh, um, um, for example, the poet and the painter casting shadows on the water, thick as a brick one. So, mm -hmm. you know, the poet and the painter. Yes. I think, I think it's a reference to Blake, though you, you can't find many. Uh, people what poet and painter That's at true. once, and That's I true. think it's 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 Blake's very case. And yeah. you could ask Ian yes. Anderson if it if it is uh, a reference to Blake. Yes, I will. I will. <laughs> I heard that it, he's not he's not that that passionate about Blake, okay. but uh, some others some others are openly mm. uh, yeah. openly passionate about Blake. And yeah. I uh, there is a very interesting book I want to show you. Yes. This um, this is a catalog of an exhibition in uh, in the U.S. and um, and this book is very nice because you can see that there is a long, very long text about uh, the influence of Blake in the counterculture in in the beat generation in you know in the 60s and 70s. Yes, and there are lots of references to to musicians like Hendrix. Uh, Jim Morrison and you know Crosby, Steve and Ash. So everybody was pretty much into Blake by then. Bob yes. Dylan himself. 
So there are some, you know, some subtle and some mm. other you know, more clear references to to his poetry. Yeah. But Bob Dylan is is was one of them, you know, of, of, of the most influenced by Blake. But he's not very keen to admit it. I yes, think. I've, I've I've read that. We'll come to him in a minute. Uh, what what's the book called? Can can you can you tell oh, us? Oh, it's um, it's William Blake and the Age of Aquarius. This, oh yes. this has been one of the most helpful books for me, and yes, it's, I believe it's that. fantastic. It covers a, a lot of, okay. of 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 things. Yeah, we'll talk about the the beat generation and and the the sixties rock movement in a minute. But you already mentioned and did those feet in in ancient time, uh, which is also yeah most mostly famous because it is kind of an became kind of an unofficial unofficial uh, national anthem uh, national uh, anthem for great britain at least the hubert perry version of the song uh, was this the first musical uh, interpretation of blake or was there one before no it wasn't the first i think the first one dates uh, from uh, 1876 but there is a, a blake scholar um Harry Davies he mm -hmm. traced a, a, an a even older one um I can't remember the year exactly but the first one registered in this book let me see if I can find it it's lovely oh, to have you it? in front of your library there <laughs> you can pick up oh yes that's the, the best book. place to be uh, <laughs> actually and this is Blake set to music oh yeah this is a a very very interesting book it's a catalog with you know uh with the list a long list of of, of songs inspired by Blake's poems and it's mostly classical you know class uh, classic music here mm -hmm. so um I, so that's when i that's where i found that the the earliest setting is from uh, 1876 but oh, yeah. um okay. I don't know how accurate it is. As I told you, this uh, this scholar found something even older. Mm -hmm. But what really um, what really led me to to write about what I'm writing at the moment about this sort of recent influence of Blake on popular music is the very fact that this uh, this book, this Blake set to music, most of the songs listed here they are you know they're, they're classic music. They're not. Uh, mm -hmm. popular music so i think there is a a, a, a turning point um, basically i think around the 60s that yes. uh, he starts uh, to be quite popular among pop musicians rock musicians and uh it's it's a movement it's a you know it's a movement that's still going on it's and yes. and in the, in the last couple of years in the last 30 years he has become even more popular but of course it you know there are lots of factors involved i think the fact that for example you you can uh, record something and and put on facebook or put on the on youtube on mm -hmm. bandcamp spotify so there are so many platforms that you can just record something and yes. you know so i think things are very easy in that sense so i think that's also uh, a factor that contributes uh, to this sort of um, increase, the yes. escalation, you know, the number yes. of, 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 of songs. Definitely, nowadays. yes. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think Blake even sang some of his poetry himself. He, 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 I think he viewed himself as a bard sometimes. He, he, he did. I think he played to, to some of his songs. Didn't Allen Ginsberg yes. say something like that? I mean, he also played played Blake's songs, I think, or, or tried to. Play yes, he said, "Well, oh, this is the album. You know, I've got everything here." Great, great. <laughs> so this is the album. Um, oh yes, "Songs of Innocence" and "Experience." I I I read somewhere that he set all of them, but here you, you know you, you can't find all the fifty-four. I think okay. is it fifty-four? But uh, so, but, but I heard that he set all, all of them uh, later on. So yes, this is the album, and I also uh, I, I also read that Bob Dylan played with him a couple of, of, of songs. He didn't record them, but I think you know they okay. eventually played together. Yes, I've, I read that too. Um, 
that they that they did two songs together. And I th I think um, Bob Dylan he, he also did, did a song later in in the eighties uh, called Every Grain of Sand, which is also a, a reference to Blake, I think. But uh, yes, yeah, Visions of Johanna, yes, also. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, yeah. and, and the, the, the most recent, the most recent song, I don't know if you're familiar with, I Contain Multitudes. There mm -hmm. is a, a reference to Blake, Blake is mentioned in, in the lyrics too. Oh, yeah. And there is another one uh, from the album Tempest, uh, yes, if I'm I correct. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Roll on John, that yeah. he that he quotes uh, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright or something. Yes, so you're right. Not, not the whole poem, but a couple of lines. Just the, yeah, yeah, you're right. Now, as you say it, I, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've listened to the album quite a lot when it came out. And I remember now, as you say it, yeah. So what do you think someone like, like Bob Dylan or the whole folk rock movement could identify with, with someone like, like William Blake and his ideas? Well, in folk music, I think that because Blake, Blake's poetry, especially his lyrical poetry, it, it embodies the, the, the balladry, you know, this, this sort of atmosphere, because Sounds of Innocence and Experience, are, the poems are very idyllic, but at the same time, they're also very critical. And, you know, we, the 60s is uh, when you have protest songs. So mm. I think he combined those two forces um, beautifully. And it's, I think that's probably why he, um, he captured this, uh, this, you know, this genre, this segment. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Blake was against, yeah, it's, it's basically the same ideas. He was against monarchy and, and he liked the spirit of the French Revolution. And when he lived in Soho, the, the Gordon riots took place in London and he witnessed them. He was against industrialization and, and uh, against social injustices, which can all be... Yes, and, yes, and one, of the, one of the lines of, of, of you know, that I'm trying to, to beard in, in, my, in the thesis is uh, it's, uh, I'm trying to associate Blake's reception, literary reception, uh, to this, uh, to his musical reception, because, yes. uh, for example, that's around that time that we have books like this, like uh, Black's Prophet Against Empire by mm -hmm. David Ehrman's too very up to date, and Jacobs Bronowski, um, A Man Without a Mask, and mm -hmm. we also have this one, William Blake and the Age of Revolution. Yes. So one yes. of my, you know, one of my theories is that. The publication of all of these books in the 50s, um, mid, uh, late 40s, mid 50s, I think in a way uh, it had some influence on this sort of uh, new perspective of Blake because we had just the mystic poets, the, the, yeah. the, you know, the, 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 the visionary the, and the mystic poet, and then um, some, you know, some scholars come up with the idea that Wow, he's not only this; he's also that. He's, he's also, also a re revolutionary. So yes. I think that this this combination of the mystic and the re revolutionary is very powerful in that time, in that particular time. So Definitely. I think that uh, that's basically what made him so appealing. Yeah. Yes, I agree. I agree uh, very much with that. It's it's all the uh, ideas and uh, what, so was was the 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 beat poets were the beat poets of the nineteen. 19th... 40s and 50s were they, they uh, the, the, the main reason or were they the ones that introduced Blake to, to, to later generations like Bob Dylan and the 60s rock mu movement? Did yes, William Burroughs I think was the, the, was the one who introduced uh, Blake to, to Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac and the likes because I think he was uh, a bit older than them and mm -hmm. he studied in Harvard if I'm not mistaken and he had access to Blake in in the university, so the, I think the, the, there is this sort of closeness. I, that's mm. one thing I'm trying to to think in, in in my thesis is that this sort of the, this Blake scholarship and Blake um, reception in you know in the Beat generation is pretty much connected um, to the academy because uh, those guys are you know this uh, the beginners of, of these movements they they they. You know they studied in university so i think that as um 
the acceptance of Blake universities. And, you know, when he started being studied more seriously mm -hmm. in universities, I think it affected his music reception. And I think that, that the figure of William Burroughs represents this sort of, uh, the, the, two, the, the, the two atmospheres, the two, um, you know, these two worlds. Yes, 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 I think so too. So, um... So we, we have the, the, the radical ideas of, of Blake, uh, as we just mentioned, and, and they, they fit perfectly to the, to, to the ideas and the movements of the, of the 1960s. And, and then there was, uh, for example, the, the band The Doors, and, and they, exactly. they are named after, uh, after The Doors of, of Perception, after Aldous Huxley's book, uh, The Doors of Perception, uh, which itself derived from Blake's from a line of, of Blake's The Marriage of, of uh, Heaven and Hell. So, uh, yeah. and then they have, um, I think they have three lines of auguries of innocence in, in End of the Night, which I, when I found this out, I thought, oh, this is, I've listened to the first Doors record for decades, basically. No, not that, but for years now. And, and I, I never noticed until I read it and I thought, oh, this, this fits perfectly. So, uh, someone like Jamal. There is another one. And there's another one, I think you, uh, lost girl or something like this yes, because I think it's a girl. reference to yeah. little girl lost. Right, yes. your yeah. lost little girl. Um, your lost little girl, yeah. So someone like like Jim Morrison. Um, they, I think there there also comes the the more there's the radical side of Blake and then the spiritual spiritual side of Blake comes comes into play there because I think someone like what what do you think? Why could someone like Jim Morrison, for example, when he wrote his lyrics, identify? With, with Blake and his ideas? Well, um, the, again, this book, this book is, is absolutely fantastic. You, you find things here that you won't find anywhere else. And there is an interview with, um, with one of his teachers in uh, UCLA, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. And he enrolled in a uh, romantic studies discipline. And his, as his final essay, he, he wrote about um, Swedenborg oh, yeah. and yeah. and the marriage of heaven and hell. So, um, one thing that I find very interesting, and uh, I, I think I'm I, I'm you know I'm 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 seeing that in the in the interviews is that most of of, of those guys who are very much into Blake, there's no such a thing as you know a superficial. Mm -hmm. um, view of Blake or this sort of very, um, uh, of, of, you know, of, of, of these, um, of these very vague idea of Blake. They, 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 they read about Blake, they read biographies and they read even like academic papers and books like the ones I, I showed. So, um, I was, I was very struck by this, you know, by these findings and um, Patti Smith, um, Bruce Dinkinson, um, Tim Blake, Gordon Giltrap, all these guys, um, Christopherson too, Chris Christopherson. Oh, yes. So, yeah, so, you know, all those guys, they, they know Blake um, quite deeply, I, I would say. You know, you can't imagine how, um, how into this they are, how connected to Blake they are, and how curious they are. And that's what I really found um, fascinating, because when you think of a rock star, you don't think of someone who, uh, who would pick up a book on, uh, you know, on theory, on literature theory, and knows um, yes. yeah. with, uh, with a bit more of detail about his involvement in, in his times, and, you know, very um, detailed analysis of poetry and things like that and you know they, they, are, they are scholars they're not only rock musicians they're scholars too in a way and I think this is the very case of, of, of Jim Morrison because um, he, he even wrote an essay and I, I would love to read the essay by the way but there you know it's not there in the book but there is this interview and I think that um, I think again that Jim Morrison, for example, he was um, maybe he was more interested. His he, he he was more inclined to embrace the mystic Blake 
but I think you know because rock is a it's um it's countercultural so rock it's uh, it's uh, it's a form of uh, you know it's a form of protest too against right. you know this sort of um the, the systems and society how it goes and uh and I think that it's a combination I think what varies is the percentage you know is the proportion of of each but yes. maybe I think that uh, that uh, Jim Morrison was more more of the mystic side of Blake. I think so too. But for for Blake, I mean the 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 mystical or the spiritual and and the radical, they they belong together for him. Uh, uh, like uh, the, the the spiritual beliefs and the radical beliefs, like you know, and and I think this this fits perfectly to. I mean, you have this 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 quote I'm, i must create my own system or be enslaved by another man's things like that and this this fits to the to the whole 60s movement also and also the spiritual spiritual side with the you know taking drugs to enhance your to expand your mind and and things like that so um i think this this fits perfectly do you think blake would have would have sympathized with the with the 60s hippie movement and uh, and all these these people Or would he have? What would he have this thought is, about this? Is a, a very good question. This is a very <laughs> good question. <laughs> It's so good that I need to stop and think because I'm, I never really give much thought should, to you that. You should include it. You should include it in your your PhD thesis. <laughs> yes, it's it's a very good question. Um, or what would would you say? Or maybe you can't answer it. But what would he have thought about a, a festival like like Woodstock? Would he have liked that? I mean, he 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 was against political repression, and and his his garden in in Hercules Road in Lambeth. He sat there. He called it Garden of Eden, and he sat there with his wife naked. So I always wonder yeah. if he would have liked this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I just can't, I just don't see him very much into this sort of crowded thing, and Ooh. and yeah, yeah. you know these uh, multitudes and. Uh, packed places and you know because uh, you know the story of Woodstock and how uh, how crowded it was I I don't think he would enjoy the the crowded side of it but the, all the rest I think he would he would approve a lot yeah. you know I think he would approve it uh, I think but I think in terms in terms of music you know like oh I like this setting I don't like this one I think because there are uh, some biographic um, uh, accounts about uh, his preference, uh, musical preferences, and he seemed to be very um, keen to, um, very fond of uh, folk music, like traditional, mm -hmm. traditional ballads, Scottish, Irish ballads. So I think maybe the folk ones, the more, the more folkish uh, tunes or Uh, maybe um, an acid folk maximum. I think he would uh, he would have enjoyed. Yes, I think he was he didn't like much classic classical music. So I, I don't think he would he would approve that. But um, yeah. I think the the folk the folk settings more likely to be his his choice his favorite. Uh, yeah, probably probably. Um, yeah, you already mentioned um, Patty Smith. And I know you also met her, I think, uh, and and she's also a Blake admirer. And sh for example, she wrote the song uh, in my Blake in year. So how how was she maybe influenced in by Blake, and how did she work this this influence into her music? I mean, this was later. It was late sixties, early seventies, mid seventies, when when she started. Well. Uh, in her interviews, she's often asked about her literary influences, and Blake is always mentioned along with Rimbaud and Genet and people like, you know, the, 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 the French guys, the French uh, symbolists. And I think um, Hermann Hesse, I think she's also very fond of Hermann Hesse. Her, um, Hesse oh, Stephen yes, Hermann Hesse, yes, and, and also Bolaños, uh, the Mexican writer. Yeah. And yes, and Uh, Blake Blake has been with her since her child since her childhood I, and I think she mentions that in in her books and she was familiar with Blake's songs of innocence and experience at an early age and if I'm not mistaken she even held a copy back then belonged to his mom I think 
And uh, Blake is also uh, mentioning her memoir, Just Kids. She used to read uh, Blake's Songs of Innocence and Experience with um, uh, Robert Maplethorpe, yeah. who was her boyfriend. And she is very much into Blake uh, to this day. And uh, she wrote the song, as you said, uh, My Blake in Ear. But she also recites or sings, if you like, um, The Tiger. And uh, in her last performance in London, which I was lucky enough to, to be there and so I could attend it. And uh, she, uh, it was a talk and the occasion of the launch of her latest book, uh, Year of the Monkey. Mm -hmm. And at the end, she, she did a couple of numbers with her guitarist, Lenny Kay, mm -hmm. Lenny Kay, right? Yes. And she chanted upon uh, the divine image, which was something very new to me because I, I hadn't heard of it until then. So I was totally caught by surprise. And of course, I cried my eyes out. <laughs> I was very moved and, yeah. and, and I didn't expect that at all. So. And later on, I learned that she she recited some lines of the same poem in Terence Malick's film uh, "Song to Song." Have you seen this? No, I haven't. No, it it just I think it's a 2017 uh, film, mm -hmm. and she seems to be captivated not only by Blake's imaginative abilities, uh, poetry, and visual production, but above all by by his engagement with social issues of his time, mm -hmm. which correspond to a great extent to our current issues, you yes. know, with minor, but with minor vari variations. And um, her Blake seems to be a non-conformist Blake again, <laughs> a revolutionary Blake, a radical Blake, but yes. also a lyric Blake, as, as, I, as I told you about this sort of proportion. But I think that Blake is, uh, for her, um, he's, um, he's the more revolutionary one because she was very much into this, uh, the sort of uh, the fight against social inequality, mm -hmm. uh, human rights, uh, it, it's still very well known, you know, and yeah. I think that he, I think that she appreciates particularly that side of play. Yes. But she's very much into poetry, she knows a lot, she's very knowledgeable about literature and poetry. When you read her interviews, she seems to be, you know, quite involved with all that, not art in general, she I think she's she's a genius, you know. Yep. She knows a lot about cinema. She knows a lot about uh, literature. She knows a lot about politics, about everything, you know. Yes. I, I want to be like her <laughs> someday. <laughs> you're you're, you're on the model. right. You're on on the right track. You're you're going to you're on the right track to become like her. And she's wonderful. I mean, I, I've seen her live once or twice, and and every time I fell in love again, basically. Because it's, it's yeah. a wonderful experience. It's it's great. So yeah, I mean, someone like Patty Smith and and Jim Morris and Bob Dylan. I I think we can agree that they they also can identify with Blake because they they are basically also outsiders of society. They stand outside of society, and so so did he in in his time, during during his time. Um, yeah. Um, we are, you already also mentioned, and I think this for me personally is just very interesting, that you talked to Bruce Dickinson of, of Iron Maiden. He also is very much influenced by Blake, and I'm a huge Iron Maiden fan and a, a huge Bruce Dickinson fan. So oh, I'm, really? I'm going to have to ask you about him. Yes, I, I am. Um, so, Bruce, um, I'm going to, to say a few words about him. Uh, on his on his solo album, The Chemical Wedding, uh, he he, this is the one that is mostly in, influenced by Blake. It has Ghost of a Flea on as as the cover, and uh, he reworked uh, and did those feet in ancient time again. He did his own into his own version of, of Jerusalem basically, and um, he was also at the at the unveiling of Blake's gravestone a few years ago at Bunny Bunny Field Cemetery. And if you read his bi biography, he also mentions Blake quite a lot. And um, yes. and uh, so you talk to him and, and how, for example, does do, does Bruce Dickinson rework and retell and did those feet in ancient time in, in his version of Jerusalem? And how does he does he use the music to underline his his interpretation? Can you say a bit about that? Yes. Um, one thing interesting about the album, I think, is that um, he he didn't really set the poems into music 
apart from Jerusalem that, mm -hmm. you know, and even, even there, you find some, you know, some, uh, he creates, he adds some line of his own, but the others are inspired by Blake. And this is something that I try to deal with in my mm -hmm. thesis because it's something quite, um, quite complicated because it's too abstract. Because when, when, I, when I'm talking about Blake's settings, am I talking about like literally at the settings of poems or the setting of ideas of Blake or the figure because there are songs that are not about poems at all but are about himself so you have this sort of immense variety mm. of, of of settings of if you like appropriations of, of his work and i think that what dickinson does is something that I, I think that blake would like it more than actual settings because i think that blake you know blake doesn't like this sort of the, the idea of imitation of mm. this idea of uh, emulation and i think that he that he believes in this sort of, you know, minute particular. So I think it's when you have the opportunity of put a bit of yourself in there. So your your own Blake. So you personify, mm -hmm. uh, you personify Blake. You 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 become Blake, your own Blake, in a way. <laughs> and I think that this idea is more interesting. I wouldn't say more interesting, but it's an it's another perspective. It's another way of addressing to. To, to Blake in a way. And mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing that I really like about, about him. Yes. Because, you know, for example, Ghost of a Flea, there's no such a poem like Ghost of a Flea. It's a no. painting. So, right. so I, I, I find quite interesting when you can uh, transform, you can set an uh, image to music. So, you yes. know, th this, this, it's, a, it's something very powerful to me. Yeah. And um, that's one thing I like. Uh, I'm not... Nowadays, I'm not very much into heavy metal any longer, but um, but I find you know I find the concept, I find the idea, I find you know what he tried to do. It's something very successful, definitely. And I must tell you that in the interview itself, it, 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 it took place last year. Oh. Last year, yes, last June. And the interview could have been a great fiasco if it weren't for Bruce, because it took me a month to prepare a meticulous questionnaire full of references to <laughs> his career, to previous interviews in magazines, to, uh, you know, books, yeah. um, his own biography. I read it, you know, I read the whole biography, you know, in tra trying to create, trying to elaborate more, you know, some sort of sophisticated, sophisticated questions yes, yes. to impress. I don't know, but I, <laughs> I forgot to that. save the and I, I forgot to save the questionnaire on my tablet. Ooh. I took with me and I found out in the interview, the file wasn't there. So Ooh. I panicked. I was, you know, <laughs> and I basically fled to England to do this face-to-face -face interview. So can you imagine how, how, you know, how miserable I felt. Yes. And I didn't know how to start the interview because I was, you know, I try, I was trying to remember the questions I prepared, but luckily he was late. Oh. So I had a couple of minutes to get myself, you know, to, <laughs> to get myself together in the first place and draft something. So I, you know, I asked, uh, I asked for a piece of paper and started uh, drafting some questions. And of course, I didn't tell him that. And I hope he won't see this video. Ah, in case, okay. Please forgive me, Mr. Dickinson. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, I'm pretty sure he will forgive you if he, if he ever sees this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it, it, it ended up being something like a stream of consciousness because I, I just let him, you know, speak his mind. So I, I let him very freely. And I think that it became something very, very surprising, something very mm -hmm. rich. And yeah. I felt that he was so passionate about like that. I just let himself go and say whatever he wanted to say with minimal interference. And actually, the result was more in interesting than I expected in a way. I, I must tell you, I was uh, tremendously surprised by how knowledgeable he is when it comes to Blake. And he seems mm -hmm. to be much more interested in his prophetic books than in his mm -hmm. lyrical poetry, mm -hmm. as you know, you can see in the album. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he's um, particularly interested in the amb ambiguity and the, the complexity of figures like Laws and All Beyond Jerusalem, um, Tell, the Zoas, right. yes, yes, and you can find all those figures in his prophetic books, right? Yes. And uh, he, he opened the conversation. That's something very interesting, and um, discussing the presence of Blake in a film by Lars von Trier, 
uh, the house that Jack built that he had just seen um, the day before. Mm -hmm. And he starts to relate the main character to Loss, one of Blake's most important, yeah. important figures. And indeed, the, full, the film is full of uh, direct ref references to Blake. And after yeah. that, he spoke of Blake's importance to him um, in a personal level. He didn't seem in much in, uh, you know, very interested in, in talk about you know the so song song by song thing, explaining mm -hmm. things, and I wasn't interested either because uh, you know, the conversation was going to a very very interesting direction, and I, I liked that because it became quite philosophical. Yeah, and that, yeah. I, I I felt that he was more interested in talking about his own Blake, about how he perceived Blake system and how um, how it affected him along the years. So it ended up being a much more, as I said, like a much more philosophical conversation than an interview about an album. And he mentioned books. He mentioned Peter Aykroyd's biography of Blake. You're probably familiar with. I oh, am. Yeah. And it's you so know, and you could take him easily for a Blake scholar because he knows an awful lot. And but at the same time, he wasn't academic at all because he was too much, you yes. know, there was too much of himself in that. It wasn't something detached as his scholars usually do. So he personal, personalized his analysis and he, uh, for example, he, he, he mentioned, he quoted that very quote that you just uh, mentioned a while ago, I must create I must a create system of being yes. enslaved by another man. Yeah. When, he, when he talked about um, his, um, uh, he's not interested in, in being, uh, you know, in taking part of things like um, Facebook, social media, social networks. And uh, he, his phone, he showed me he, his, um, his phone and it's a very old one. Yeah. He doesn't like the idea of, you know, this high tech things that he will be bothered all the time by texts and, and phone calls and everything. He said, like, I use it only when extremely necessary, yes. but I hate it. I, I hate this sort of thing because this is now the word, word enslaves men. So this is the system that enslaves men nowadays. And I found it quite, you know, so, so right. profound in a way. And, He's and, right. I'm, I'm, and I was impressed that he being that, you know, this superstar, this super famous guy tries to be as detached from this, this sort of, 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 of digital uh, world, the best he can, and I think he mentions uh, he mentions he mentions that in the in the uh, you know in that the, the day in the old street cemetery. Yeah, yeah. He, mm -hmm. I think he mentions something like this. Yes, he also. I, I think so too. Yeah, I think this is. Uh, I, when I hear something like that, I always feel a bit bad <laughs> because <that's, laughs> you feel like I'm too much in it. <laughs> The, the funny thing is, I, 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 I personally, I really started, I started really late with all these, these, these things. For, for years, I said, you know, I had, the, the, just like him, probably, this old mobile phone with, with just, you know, sending SMS, and, and that's, that's all. And, and um, no WhatsApp, no, no Facebook, no Twitter, nothing. And um, I, I did this un, until, I don't know, two or three years ago. So I was very... You know, everybody. At any every time someone said about something about it, I was like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not part, gonna participate in that. And then I started, you know, um, working in the media and with the media, writing for magazines, doing my own things, and and working for 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 an agent agency and stuff like that. And I started doing social media for for companies. So I thought if if you want to be, it's it's a bit of a two-sided thing if you want to be part of or if you you work with the media you have to be kind of part of it and then you maybe you can use it the the best way possible for for yourself you you don't have to do everything you know but you can do it the the way that that suits you but i oh sometimes i think so it's a matter of balance in yeah, the end, isn't right. it? but sometimes i think maybe i should quit it all especially when i when i hear things like that things like when when but you know, yeah, he's, but, you know, but it's still, uh, you know, but it's still he's got a phone, so you yeah. know, he's, he tries to be the minimal possible, you know, the, the minimal possible, but yeah. he's not totally out of it. I think it's very difficult to be, you know, a hundred percent out yeah. of it. But I think, I think he's right. I think someone like like Blake would would 
do it the same way. He'd say, "This is the system, and I don't want to be part. Want to be part of." This. Yes, it would be very counterproductive for him, yes. <laughs> as it is for us. Yes, 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 <laughs> I yes, always yes. think of the books I should be reading instead of scrolling down. Yeah, that's true. I feel the same way. But on the other hand, we would have never would never have. Yes, exactly. Yes, so, you know the, it has. And for example, the the meetings of the Blake Society. You know, we need to, to be connected. We need to. Right. Yeah. You know, we need to join Zoom for and this it, conversation. You know, right. you're in Germany and I'm from Brazil. So I think that it's a it's a, a question of balance. I think right. that it's um, um, you know the me uh, um, Technology makes things easier, and we, sh we we cannot deny that. I think it's right. all a matter of balancing things. Absolutely true. I absolutely agree with that. Um, and yeah, especially right now during the the, the COVID the pandemic. Times, yeah. During the pandemic, yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask you. I think you you told me this uh, before, but I was interested because Bruce Dickinson he. He, uh, there, there's this wonderful live video with him and Ian Anderson where they play Jerusalem and it's very, very much of a folk song and, and all the rock and metal stuff is left out. And I love, I love this version because I think this is very, uh, it almost sounds ancient. It almost sounds as if it came from, from, from Blake's period. Um, yes, yes, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful um, combination. But right. I think they didn't record that. It's it's Am only right? on YouTube and yeah, and, it's on, uh, only on YouTube. It's just like a not the best quality, but I think yeah. it's wonderful nevertheless. But how I wanted to ask you how you became uh, the translator for for doing the the Portuguese version of Thick as a Brick Part Two for Ian Anderson and Jeff Hurtal. Wow, it's an it's a very crazy story because I was um, I was backpacking. I was um, in in, a, in in Ireland, and you know after after a very uh, complicated breakup, I decided to travel abroad. And Good choice, yeah. So, yes, to, to find some time for myself, and of course, it was I tried to do it in a strategic way. So I tried to to combine the trip to some concerts I would like to see and some of them I would never see in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ian Anderson um, and Jeff Rotal, they, they play in Brazil quite regularly, mm -hmm. but I wasn't sure because I, I heard of uh, Martin Bear mm -hmm. leaving the band. So I, was, I, I wasn't sure if I would see Stick as a Brick tour in Brazil. So I tried to you know, I, I tried to make sure that I would be able to attend that concert, along with Maddie Pryor and uh, Griffon and some other, you know, small niche bands, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, it ended up being quite, uh, quite, uh, I think, a quite good idea. <laughs> and uh, I travel all the way to, I was in London, um, and I travel all the way to Newcastle, and there was some, uh, some sort of accident with the tire. Oh. And... Um, and I got at uh, the concert because I, 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 you know, I expected to be there earlier so I could leave my, my stuff in a hostel or something. But there was no time and I got there late and the concert started and I was carrying like a big boron, uh, you know, the, the instrument, the Irish instrument. Mm -hmm. I, I bought a big boron and, uh, and my, my big bag with me and, you know, a small theater with very small seats. So... I became a, an inconvenience for my fellow, <laughs> my fellow colleagues who were there just to see, um, to see him too. And at the end, I I did just like everybody does in the sense that I was there in the back of the theater, in the exit door, waiting for him to come out. And but at the time, I had no no CDs or whatever with me. But I said, like, I just want to, to tell him that um, um, I started playing flute, playing the flute because of him. So yeah. uh, that's all I'm going to do. <laughs> and when he saw me, I was first thing I was the only the only person under under 50 there, probably. Ooh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I was a woman, the only woman there. And uh, and he was like. And with a big bag, so what this alien is doing here? Yeah, yeah. I think that's what it is. And 
that was his um, impression. And as I um, approached him to say that, to say, oh, I um, just okay. wanted to, to, to thank you for your music. And I started playing the flute because of you. And said, so like, what are you doing here with this big bag? <laughs> And this big uh, and 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 and, and I, will, I also carry this, you know, this boron, my my left or right hand, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. And said, so, "Oh, this is an um, Irish instrument. I was I, I've just been in Ireland." <laughs> <laughs> and we started uh, chatting, a very nice conversation. And I told him that I studied literature and everything. So I'm like, "Oh, I think I need uh, you. You are exactly what I'm looking for. I need a <laughs> translator for." I think it's a break too. Um, you know, I'm, uh, th there'll be an anniversary edition um, with a big book, and I would like to to add some some translations of you know of, of some yeah. language, and I would like Portuguese too. And do you think you can do it? <laughs> and I said, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> Yes, yeah. but of course I wasn't a translator. <laughs> my my only attempt was that one. You know, back in two thousand four or five when I was trying to translate Blake, but with a dictionary. So no, you know, I had no technique, I had nothing. So I accepted the, the challenge and I we just ex exchanged em emails when I was, um, um, you know, when I was confused about some things. And that's how, that's how I ended up translating them. Wonderful. That's that wonderful. Was a, a yeah. fun thing. A fun thing that ended up in this sort of very, very, you know, very precious collaboration for me. I'm very, I'm very happy to. Yes. I was very happy to do that. I, I can imagine. I mean, this is wonderful. You were at the right place at the right time. So, and, and this exactly, was... exactly. And this, these things are so true. You know, we think, oh, it's like it's bullshit. You know, it doesn't. Yeah, it's, 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 it's exactly... not like these. Uh, yeah. It's. Yeah. Oh, Yes, but yeah. it, it works very much for me. I think my life is full of this sort of, um, of, of, you know, of lucky things, uh, being the right place in the right time with the right people. And but this is the most exciting life. This is the the, the best best way to to live a life. So and and how you said you are preparing a, a Portuguese translation of Jerusalem, of Blake's Jerusalem. Can you tell me how how this came together how this happened well i tell you what happened and <laughs> it's pretty much uh, related to dickinson's interview because he started uh, you know um making references to all those characters uh, from his uh, from black's prophetic books and i was you know oh my goodness yes it sounds amazing but i've got no idea whatsoever what it's talking about <laughs> and i was like oh yes i agree and but i didn't understand a thing mm -hmm. uh, and i said like i think um i'll be i'll be better start reading those those books am i a blakian or not because <laughs> it was very difficult for me you know because um his punctuation, his constructions are so so complex. It's not so. It's not just a matter of language. It's also a matter of, of complexity of ideas. And I okay. couldn't I couldn't get it. I couldn't yeah. reach what he meant. And yeah. I think it's I even... think that translating it, translating it could be a you know the perfect of opportunity because you know you you need to to read a line a thousand times. To translate it, you know, to get the idea and um, to, you know, to translate it with some accuracy. So um, it ended up, uh, it, it started as um, a hobby or like um, in my spare time, my free time, I, uh, I'll do this. But I became completely obsessed with the text and I started uh, uh, with the last book. So you see um, the same characters, you see like the beginning of the story. Um, in previous books, so it, it it became even more difficult for me to translate it because I had no access yeah. to the other text, so I wasn't that familiar with the previous text. So it was just crazy for me to start, you know, like the other way round. So start from the end, not start from the beginning. Yes. But um, but I'm completely fascinated, and now I and. Uh, of course, I've got the the, the, the the interview recorded, so 
I I had to play it to understand. Now I understand what he's you know what he meant, yes. what he, sure. he was talking about, and I uh, and I feel like oh now um, I learned. It's like I learned Blake's language, or I'm learning at least Blake's language. So mm -hmm. I think now I start to have some idea of, of, of you know of, of his mind of of his thoughts about things of you know of his yeah. philosophy if you if you like I, and I, um, yes and I finished I, I finished this but of course it's never finished because every time you read it you find something new and you find another interpretation for things so translating like I think you, you could never really finish this if you could just like Oh, I'm tired of you. I don't want to see you any longer. And you say you're finished, but I think it's there's no end. It's endless. And right. but I'm I'm I think I'm 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 uh, trying to do some you know some um, minimal alterations, and uh, I'm and I'm going all the way through for like the fifth time now. So um, yeah. I think it will be as because because I'm obsessive. I think it would take you know it would take a time for me to to let it go. Yes, sure. But then the next project will will come along. Um, yeah. Yeah. I if if you if you're doing Jerusalem, there's also the of course the connection to London and and London is very important for for Blake in in his works. And um, is there some kind of um, in in the music, for example, or in in the the music that that you've analyzed and the people you've talked to, is there is there some kind of is is London important for them in in a way, or is the influence of London and on Blake is, is somehow important, or is this only important if you're from London and in London and and for artists that are mainly or more connected with the city? Well, I think I think that um, most people really are concerned with the importance of London to Blake are probably Londoners or English mm. people or English artists, I would say. I think it's the case of Dinkinson, for example, because he, he finds the you know, England's geography and England's history quite important for him to understand Blake. Yeah. Um, but again, as I told you, um, I, I think that most art, m most of artists, they try to find their own Blake. So you mm. have like Brazilian versions of Blake, you know, Brazilian settings of Blake, and nothing. London has got nothing yeah. to do with that yeah. at all. I so I, I think I think other things are more important than uh, you know London, particularly than the geography where it happened. And I think I, and I think that it's pretty much. Um, the idea of universal literature, uh, you know, of the of the universal writers, and I think that's the case of Blake. Of course, London uh, in a great deal because when you see Jerusalem, because he kind of um, he creates a city over another city. When he, you know the, the the walls, the pillars of gold of mm -hmm. Jerusalem. So it's you know there is a spiritual a spiritual city and um, and a material city. And he connects them, so he right. put them uh, in the same in the same area, in the same geographic area. So it's something quite quite new. I I, I never heard of anything like that. What he did, right? And I think maybe that's... just Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yes. but I think this that... there, this might be the connection. I mean, as you say, this this everybody finds his own Blake. And, and reworks his own leg. But I think this may be the connection when, when he sees London as a visionary city and, or a spiritual city and, and the real city. Uh, this, is, this is one of his main topics and ideas. Um, the, the, the things he imagined were, were just as important to him as, as the real things. And this is something, exactly. a, a, again, which could, could be said about maybe the, the 60s hippie movement or rock movement. The spiritual yes, side the was idea, yes, the ideal society. So the alternative societies, in a way, they are forms of Jerusalem, fine yes. forms of, of, you know, of, of creating their own Jerusalem, in yeah. a way. Yeah, I, I always wonder, but this is just pure speculation, I always wonder what, what Blake would say about modern modern day London. I don't think the, the spirit has changed that much, in a way. I think he would re still recognize the, the, the spirit of the, of the city. 
you know, there's still the rich and the poor with, with you know, bankers in the city of London and then you've got the poor people sleeping sleeping on their on their doorsteps. Yes. And you're being it's you're just being another observed, form. You're you're being observed by CCTV all over the city, which is still, you know, you're still oppressed in in a kind of way and still I think it hasn't changed that much. And uh, Yes, it's just like a, a, a modern, a modern London, but still the same, you know, the, the, the same old problems, but right. with the new, with a new face. Right, the, the spirit's still there. I think he would still recognize the, 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 yeah. the London of his day and the spirit of, of his day. So, uh, you and just, one thing, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just one thing to, to say uh, before you go on is, uh, is that uh, one thing that I find uh, quite Mm, I, I don't I don't know if I quite understood it uh, because he 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 gives some sort of uh, he attributes uh, masculine or feminine qualities yes. to places too. So because you know Jerusalem is a woman and London is a man. So when when he needs to use like an article to when he refers to London, it's not like it. It's not like mm. a neutral. It's a he. Yeah. And. Uh, some countries are like feminine, like Erin, which is who's uh, Ireland, who stands for, for, for Ireland, so it's a woman, and mm. London is a man. I find, you know, I would like to understand, I, I, I would love to read something, you know, some analysis about, uh, about it, because um, so he sees London as like a masculine force, it's a masculine spirit, because, you know, things for him, they, 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 they have like, they have a soul, so yeah. cities also have a soul have a, have qualities um, mm. and uh, I find it quite intriguing that, that he finds London that finds that London is a man or is maybe, masculine. Maybe someone who's watching this can can provide an answer. In... Oh please. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah I think I think it's uh, th there is such a thing I have I read this when I when I wrote my book when I did the research but it's too far away now. Um, I mean, there is something like, you know, the pla places have, uh, the, the, there's female places and there, there are male places. There is this, this theory and this idea. And what I find interesting is that you say, Blake, for him, London is a, is a, is a man. I, I think in most of the literature that I, I read and then most of the ideas about London and whatever, it, Peter Eckhart, Alan Moore, whoever it is, they all say that in, if, if you analyze London that way it's, it's it's a woman that London is a woman and I, I personally I, I can yes for me too that's what I was just about to say London is a woman I, I for me personally yeah. too and and but the I think the Thames it's father Thames the the river is, is that's the man <laughs> you know and the, it's he's, he's the straight the straight thing that that runs through 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 London so it's father Thames and maybe mother London although he, you, you get how interesting i never thought that way for me it was just like the sort of inner feeling i've got an inner feeling yes. that maybe the inner feeling it's, that... it's nothing it's nothing that i could like rationalize it's just the right. sort of how i perceive london for me it has quite a feminine energy me yeah i think absolutely i think so too yeah and it's just like you said it's, it's more of a you 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 feel it you can't explain it it's just a feeling that you have uh, and this is this is very interesting, um, but yeah, yeah, you you lived in London. You you said you lived in London for I think two periods of time, two brief periods. Uh, is that right, or am I wrong? No, no, it, it's right. I've been there like mm, uh, a few times, but living there uh, twice, but for brief periods mm. um, of six months. So it's not it's not much to be that familiar with with the city and when, as as soon as you start to get used to buses and you know <laughs> how to move around it's time to go back and I find mm. it so you know so frustrating for me personally you yes. know because for me the geography I, I feel that I'm I I, I feel that I I'm, I'm I integrate it I feel that you know I'm there yes. when I when I when I can, when I don't need to think much, you know, I, I just can find my way mm -hmm. in the city, and and that that's uh, that's the frustrating bit for me. Yeah. When uh, you know, when I started, when I started to get used to it, it was time to go back. So yeah, uh, 
I hope to be able to stay a bit longer. I think, I, I, I don't know, um, we talked about this briefly uh, because for me, it's very complicated to feel like a foreigner, to feel like an intruder. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's a very a strange feeling. And it starts with language itself because I'm, as you probably noticed, I'm quite talkative and I, I feel this urge to communicate. Yes. And I think that everybody has a, you know, their own way of, uh, of, of saying things. And I think this barrier of language, when you have, when, it, when your repertoire is much more reduced, it's like I'm, I'm in a cage in a way. So mm -hmm. communication becomes uh, something painful to me instead of something that, you know, mm -hmm. frees me, something that made me feel like, oh, I can say it the way I want to say it. So yeah. it, it's all about repetition. You learn some new expressions and you find them interesting and you, they may be useful in some you know, in some situation, and you, you know, and you you borrow it and you you use it, and you you don't have your own way of saying things. You don't have you can you can put your personality mm -hmm. in words. So I I find it I find it extremely painful, and this is the first thing. And the second thing, you know, we are living in in times of hatred, in times yeah. of intolerance, in times of racism, and. Um, I, I, you know, I felt that uh, in, in London. I, oh. I've been through a very, very traumatic experience of racism really? in London. Oh. Yes, and, uh, and it's, you know, here in Brazil, like I'm a privileged person. And, uh, I, but here too, I, I think I've been through some things uh, similar to this because I'm from the North. And uh, in Brazil, there's some sort of prejudice I think everywhere in the world countries, there are some more privileged areas than others. Mm -hmm. And my, you know, my hometown, the area where I'm from, it's a poor area. And in terms of education, you, you can find the best opportunity. So I've, I've, in a way, I'm also a foreigner here. But mm -hmm. I think that when you're abroad, I think the, the, the language thing makes things even more uh, painful. Yes. So I don't know if I would be able to live abroad forever. For me, it's very, it's very, yeah. uh, it's very important to feel at home. And I, although I love, I desperately love London. I love uh, so many things about London and uh, music and everything. I don't, it, it, you know, I, and I have no, uh, no explanation for this because it's, it's not like oh, it's my, it's your parents' heritage. It's something that you know you learn to like. But it was something quite um, on my own, you mm -hmm. know, something that developed on my own and I can't explain. And you start thinking of these things, oh, it comes from previous lives, I don't know, it's just colonization, cultural colonization, and deal with that, don't romanticize things. It's, you know, we live in an English dominated world, so it's just uh, something mm -hmm. caught in this trap. <laughs> I, I, I don't know it's something I, it's very hard to explain that and uh, I try to romanticize but I know that's it's a bit deeper than that you know do why too. why do I know nothing about um you know about um Guatemala and I do know a lot about about English culture so it's right. not just something that I I was looking uh for but something that is brought to me you know this sort of the, the, the capital, capitalism and imperialism in culture as well. So. But I, I feel the same way. I, I often wonder, um, because we, there are places you, you, you feel more drawn to than to other places and then cultures and whatever, literature, music, everything. Um, but when I was, I, I was all, always interested in, in Britain and, and British history, English literature, whatever. And when I was in London for the first time, I, 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 I knew London for, for years, but I've never been there. You know, before I was been there the first time, I've, I've read so much about it and things like that. And then I was there for the first time and I thought, yes, this, this is it. This is the, somehow the place that I belong to. And I couldn't explain it too. And I always thought, well, where, where, did, where does this come from? You know, <laughs> there, there's nothing... Where's, where does this come from? Logical, there's where, nothing what's the really reason? logical about it. Hmm? Sometimes there's nothing logical about it. Right. But, 
And in I, the end, there is some logic. And I always say, I always say that, just as you said, I say, I, I think I lived there in a former life. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think I'm, that that must be the reason because some some of these streets they feel so familiar to me, and, and I don't know why. But I I always say I, I think I, I lived there in a former life. Maybe, but even if it's wrong, it's it doesn't matter because I I, I like it and I love it. So. Uh, but what about but what about the the the, the the bitter side of it, of this sort of influence all over the world of this, sort yes, of, you know. You're absolutely right about that. Uh, imposition of uh, imposition of culture, you know. Right. No, you're absolutely right about that. Uh, I I don't know. I think it's 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 there. This in, in in Germany is it common that people are drawn to you know to like English culture and language and. I don't know. We do have, we do have. Uh, funnily enough, we're we're very keen for of, on on British crime fiction and British crime TV series. They're all over German TV. Uh, I see. But I, there, there's not that much of it. I mean, we're we're quite close to one country is quite close to to the other in in terms of geography. Uh, maybe that's one of the reasons. I think. Yeah, I think that the. the Germany is, and, and Britain, they, they, although they, they don't really, I, I have to, to say that, uh, there, there is a kind of, they, they like, we like Britain, but I don't think the, the, the people like each other. You know what I mean? I think there's, there's something like, I know exactly oh, what oh, you mean. Germans, yeah. oh, those, those Britons, you know, they, there's, there's this, maybe some sort of, um, of so but sore from the war maybe uh but this is a very <laughs> european thing this is uh, you know ah oh, those britons are oh, those french people and, and they say ah oh, the bloody germans and this is i think this is a very european thing because we are all we're all so close to each other and then we have this yes and uh, and very close in power as well so you know right. germany is also economically a very one of the leaders of uh, probably the leader of European Union along yes, with France. So yes, I think there is this tension with you know the Brexit proves it in a way. Yes, yes, uh, definitely true. Yeah, uh, we'll we'll see where that goes. Where where Brexit uh, goes. Um, so um, so being in London was not an, an entirely positive experience for you, uh, but I I think I understand that yeah no but you know uh, um average it was uh, i would love to go back at some point and i would love to stay longer it's I, i'm just saying that it's not like it's not just like oh um it's not perfection i think mm -hmm. that our idea is much more um uh it's much more interesting than the actual experience sometimes yeah. and sometimes. i think that this yeah. The sort of rom rom uh, romanization of, uh, of, of yeah. what, for, for example, for us who live in South America, what, uh, what is it like living in Europe? And I think there are lots of uh, misconceptions. There are lots of, of uh, expectations that don't correspond to reality, especially, you know, you're, so you're like a second home sort of citizen in a way. And, mm. um, second class it's and I'm, uh, it's it's very complicated and that's why for me it's something it's something i, I don't i don't really like and uh, yeah you and you're always dealing with that somehow yeah you know, you, it's something very subtle it's not something that it's you know it's very clear but if you if you're a bit like sensitive and you can you can you can feel it yes yes you, do you have a favorite place in London when, when you were there? Is there something like a favorite place? Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, I think Strand area is my, my favorite place um, because I, I've studied in, at King's College. So in, this, in the central campus, Virginia Woolf's buildings and the other, name, the other building, mm -hmm. I forgot the name. But I was always around the area, Chancery Lane, Mm -hmm. and near Bond, you know, Bond Street Station and yeah. I love the area and, uh, you know, the, the, the buildings and um, 
courts of justice. Um, yeah, that's uh, very, very beautiful building. And it, you know, you could, could walk uh, to, uh, to Waterloo and the Waterloo Bridge, and uh, you, you know, just like a stone throw from uh, to from um, to South Bank Center. And I could, uh, you know, I was able yeah. to see lots of interesting concerts there. Yes. And so, you know, it's a very lively place, a very lively area. And, uh, and you see like the old and the new there. That's and the it's, uh, yes, and uh, there are many places very dear to me, Delaunay Cafe, um, uh, what else? Um, the, the, you know, walking along uh, Waterloo Bridge, um, it, it gives you a very, very interesting feeling. That's true. Um, you know, to walk by the Thames and uh, yes, yeah, very, very, very interesting area. It's the most, um, uh, it's the area that reminds me of, of uh, the, 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 when I think of London, I think of, of Strand area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Strand Street. Have, have you ever been to one of the Blake locations in in London to to his grave or to to one of his in the buildings in, in Hercules Road where he lived. Did you ever visit these places? Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, Fountain Court, uh, Hercules be buildings. Mm -hmm. I think all all of the places he lived. I think I've been all of them. Yeah, and. I had the you know the fabulous opportunity of uh, his um, on his birthday last year. There was um, a, a meeting, a reunion, and uh, the Blake Society in in his house in South Mountain Street. Oh, yeah. And I had the opportunity of go upstairs, so I was there when he lived, wonderful. and and I think that this was one of the most remarkable experiences for me. And, yeah. Um, I understand. And uh, Jimi Hendrix lived like a, a few a few meters away from from his house. He lived in the same house that Handel lived. Right. And yeah, I love these. Familiar with that. There's yes, they're very close flag. to each other. <laughs> yes, and the, in this book, I'm uh, you know this this pink book, this um, the author um, writes about uh, some songs, um, Wind Christ Mary, Buddha yeah. Child that uh, there are references uh, to, to Blake and probably uh, the fact that they lived close to each other, that of course in different times, but he probably passed through you know, his door and he saw his name or something and that might have... Maybe it was, maybe the place, yes. the place influenced both of them. Maybe that's again the thing about places that influence the people that live there. Maybe. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, um, yes. Thank you very much, Camilla. We've come to the end. Oh, uh, no more questions. Thank you. And we've talked quite a long time. Um, oh, yes. I think Sorry was... about I talk too much. No, it was, it was fine. It was very, very, very nice. And, and uh, I really liked that. Um, I wish you all the best with your PhD. And I hope thank that you very we, much. Ben. I hope that we can read it someday. Let me know. Let us know when. It's yes, um, yes, it's 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 been written in Portuguese, but you know, let's, let let us see how things go. But uh, yeah, I, 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 because people write, uh, people write, P, you know, the the thesis long, long. They take a long time writing theses that nobody <laughs> reads. So I, <laughs> I, I I'm really trying to do something that. Um, can you know can be read uh, later on I don't know but uh, I think that's something that I want because for me it's not just you know it's not for it's not for a title it's not for you know to be called like a PhD a doctor no. you know I'm not interested in any of that for me it's just like to to produce something out of my passion because I, I think it's completely moved by passion right this, yeah this yeah, you we, you should you should do something with it when it's when it's done. You know, I don't know, publish it in a way. Um, yes. Hope, hope. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Camilla, for for being my guest, for for taking your time. I'm very honored. I'm very honored. Thank yes. you very much.